Welcome to the program. Sunday morning, the Heritage Museum in Simonstown, there's lots of activity happening here. I know that Auntie Patty is joining us to tell us more about how the museum started. She's the founder member. Welcome, Auntie Patty. Now, a couple of minutes ago, you told me that you obviously have found a member of the museum. And there's an interesting story around that. So for us to understand the museum itself, we need to understand why you started it. With the land restitution at coming into existence, I claimed for all my dad's property. So this house belonged to public works. It was used by the Navy. And they phoned me and said, look, the house is going on, uh, is up for rent. Don't you want to take it over? Don't you want to rent the place? And I said, no, what must I be rent the place for? We've got the, the claim in and there's a moratorium on the property. You can't rent it. So she said to me, well, look, don't you want to take it over? Take it over as a family and uh, offer us a nominal rent but you've got to fix the place. So you can imagine what it looked like, because it was real derelict. And uh, I spoke to the family, at that time, most of the family was still alive, but they were all old. And everybody said, we're all pensioners, how are we going to look after the of place? Course. But fortunately or unfortunately, my husband and I had just sold our house in Crawford. So we were on the lookout for something smaller. And then we said, all right, we will come and look after the place because my husband being in the building trade, we could fix it. And we like, you know, uh, doing so things like thing that, is. yeah. So we came here thinking that we going to be for a year or two. And uh, after a year, uh, two years, I was still here. At that time, I joined the Simonstown Museum. And then I realized, you know, that is a museum about all the people, but not specifically about us, the people that were forcibly removed, and not about the Muslim. You know, it had yes, snatches, so, so, so you snatches. Want to, you so want to get what this more yes. Meanwhile, I have always been interested in genealogy, tracing people's families. So I sat down with a paper and I wrote down all the names of the streets that I knew and then I fitted in who lived where. And I thought, I wonder what happened to them. And then I spoke to family and friends and people from Ocean View, and everybody just thought, no, it's a good idea to start a museum. And I said, well, I've got the place. It's only my husband and I upstairs, and voila. There and it, that's, is. That's where it is. Yeah. And I must admit that uh, it's my first visit here. Yeah. And I've taken a bit of a walk around. Not I realized when I walk around there's so much to see and learn. I suppose that you need to spend a couple of days to actually go through because what happens now when you come in is you tend to just quickly breeze through because you are yes. cut for time and sort of thing. Yes. But there's just a lot that we've seen now, and learned in the last half an hour. Yes, now I have retired now. But I still do the genealogies. People come and they make an appointment and so you I trace show, their roots back to I show them how to do it. And if it's from Simon's down, I've got lots of old photos and old documents and newspaper cuttings of the old Simon's down. So I assist them with doing the tracing of the family. Now, back in the day when you started this up, did you know that it will grow into what it has to No. It, look, I, I just retired and I thought, OK, this is something just to, to wind me down. It's become a full-time job. It became a full-time <laughs> job because this has been in existence, what's it now? Uh, since 1994, 1995 okay, so I came here. Yes. So it's almost 20 years, 20 years yes. that I am back in Simonstown. And um, then I was actually started with the two front rooms. But slowly people came here and they said, wow, this is our museum, this is about our people. And also my husband and I and whoever at that time helped we gave in-depth talks to the people, guided tours that took sometimes two hours and more going through the, the rooms. And then slowly 
it just expanded and people brought more pictures and more artifacts and before we knew it the entire bottom was taken over and you know after uh, almost as I say, almost 20 years that I've retired, I'm getting tired now. No, of course. <laughs> I can't, I it, can't it do well, this anymore. Uh, it's nice that you're telling us the history of history itself. I think what we should do is take a brief walk around and just sort of show us some of the areas and what to deal with. I do know that some of the other guests coming on the program a bit later is going to give us a bit of in-depth mm -hmm. into some of the items, but I think let's go and take a walk. that you basically started, uh, I started with these two rooms? I started with these two rooms. That was in 1998 when I opened I up this. Have a look inside. Right? This yeah. is the actual Breitskamme of what it li was like when um, when the people lived in Simon's Land, the 1930s, 1920s. You know, we've got records of that. But of course, some, some people have been here since the 1700s. But this is just to show the, the bright karmas uh, and the way they dressed in my lifetime. Uh, you know, I know that specifically in the Malay community, and I think any community, that has been a tradition for very long. But specifically in the Malay community, I know that it was a heavy tradition. And the room had to be done a certain way. And, yes. and the dress and the picking up of the bride and the hajis and all yes. those kind of things. So I think you've encapsulated a lot of that. I see dresses here of the 1930s. 1930s, How you 1940s. Get your hands on such things? Okay, uh, a lot belonged to, most of the stuff belonged to the people of Simonstown, incidentally. I tried to make it authentically Simon's done, even though the history of the Cape Malay, the Muslim, the coloured, is the same in all areas. But this I wanted to show that it is specifically Simon's done. This is a museum about Simon's done. And other the people words. of Simon's done. And the pe yes, the people of Simon's done. This was in, that was the first room. That was the first room. And this and was this the second was one the that second started room. out. I think let's go in there. You can tell okay. us about this one. Okay. I know that we're not welcome to have the cakes. At all. They look <laughs> yeah. a bit fresh now. Well, uh, they're fresh now. But the cakes that were originally on here, we, we put on the table in 1998. And we only just took it off now for Roshini. But this is now her regime. So she's got to... Uh, 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 you know, see two things, and she has replaced the, the cakes now. The uh, savouries is a bit funny still because she hasn't replaced it, but just now she'll go and buy some and replace it with that. So, so to start uh, uh, her regime, <laughs> she's, gonna put new she's got down. to do her thing. Yes. This particular room this, itself. Um, this was just the, the, fir the first room with. Um, all the miscellaneous photos that I had, the people of Simonson, the, the buildings, the shops, the Indian community. Incidentally, our Indian community was never moved from Simonson. They Was that for political reasons? Or? No, the reason was at that time there was only Ryland's estate. Oh, yes. So they took all the people, all the Indian people from all the areas and put them into Ryland's estate, right? When they came to Simonstown, there was houses, but there were no shops. So our Indian community had an advocate fight their case, and they said, we are prepared to move to Rylands on condition that we get shops as well. You all know Indian people are <laughs> shopkeepers, oh, oh especially, so especially that time. So they said, give us shops and a house and we will go. It never happened, that's why you're still in the areas, here and there you see the Indian shops. For that reason, they didn't have, they didn't have it. Pelican Park and Craven Bee and all that. It's only now in your children's time, not in ours. And the fact, okay, so this was the second room. Where, yes. where did you extend to after that? Okay, then I extended into this little you alcove here. Yeah. Although this might be a very small corner, I popped around in this corner a couple of minutes ago and I found lots and lots of interesting items. And I think Aunt Pat is going to tell us why she extended into this corner. Yeah. Okay. This corner is about the pilgrims the, uh, to Mecca, the, the Hujaj, 
and the pilgrimage to Mecca. And this is actually the member of Simon's Town Mosque. Oh, when does this date to? That exactly? dates to about the early 1900s, late uh, 1890s. Mm. So very solid. Yeah. yeah. We had some in here, but I just extended this. This is about the uh, royal visits, etc. So, okay. so basically, after the two rooms and the small section on that side, you then found you're getting more items and you need to go this way. That's right. Okay, let's have a look. Okay. So what we did first was to take in to take in this room. Because we needed a bigger room because by that time we were having uh, school, school groups coming. So that's why we started this about the fishermen and we went more into detail about the forced removal and more by that time our Christian community they said you can't just have it about the Malays because they were we, were all part of the we were all forcibly removed, yeah. yes, and th that's why we started the section. And then from here we started the other two rooms and the sections, the two sections here. Well, that was an interesting discussion by Auntie Patty, who is the founder member of the museum, and she's telling us about the history of the history of the museum itself. That's quite interesting. Now, our next guest is Jolene Young, and she's going to tell us about more about the actual areas of the museum, some of the history of some of the displays and that sort of thing. Jolene is a historian, and she's able to give us that sort of insight. Thank you, Faisal. I'd like to begin at the beginning, so let us walk to the bride's room. Will you go this way? I'm going to go deeper than just discussing this as a bridal room. I'm going to go back to the days of slavery in Simonstown. The earliest slaves in Simonstown were from South Asia and Southeast Asia. And a lot of these slave women there were brought here from there with seamstresses. And in the old Dutch homes, there would be a wall where slave women sat and they would sew and, and do lace and embroidery. And if you have a look at, at these beautiful bridal garments here and you look at the lace work, you can see the message and the gifts and the skills that were passed down from slave women to their daughters which originated here in Simonstown. The first slaves who were brought here came, arrived in 1743 as, as part of when the VOC declared Simonstown a winter anchorage and there was also a settlement, Dutch settlement in the area. However, at the Admiralty House there was an earlier settlement of slaves in 1725. Unfortunately, this was a, um, a gentleman by the name of Antoine Fisser who had a home. He was the first Dutchman to settle here and because of Dutch settlement obviously the koi were, were dispossessed because of their water courses being blocked by Dutch settlement. So you know by Dutch, the Dutch settling here the koi were dispossessed and they brought slaves to do the labour. Oh. Very important historical value in terms of what the Asian and Southeast Asian slave women brought with them to Simonstown. Thank you. And you know, I'm sure um, some people wouldn't know that the typical when a young Muslim woman gets married, the, the, the family of her husband would prepare a bridal room. And this is typical of the bride's karma where there's all the lace work and the room would be prepared for the bride. This room depicts the bridal table. A table would be prepared for the bride and these are also typical of the East, the sweet meats, the samosas, the kind of food that the, the Muslim bride would eat in the Muslim family, the, the Malay cuisine as such. You also, if you have a look here, there was an interesting Indian community in Simonstown. This wall displays the Indian community. The Indian community arrived in Simonstown in the late 1800s. They all came from the same village in India and settled here and they were the business people who started businesses in, in, in Simonstown. 
The community were dispossessed from Simon's time. Of this community, 80% were very poor. One must remember that after slavery, when slave, the slaves were emancipated in 1834, and there was a four-year apprenticeship period, so they were in effect only released in, from slavery or bondage in 1838. But whereas the slaveholders were be paid compensation for the loss of labor, slaves were released into a state of poverty. They were not given any compensation. So there was a, about 80% of people who lived in Simonstown who were of slave descent were very poor. The Indian community were different. They were business people and they came and there are still businesses in Simonstown owned by the Indian community who go back 200 years in Simonstown. Okay. Other people who were brought to Simonstown were West African people. After the emancipation of slaves in 1834, the Navy brought West African people to come and work in Simonstown. One of those descendants is Mr. Peter Clark, our famed um, artist and writer who lives in Ocean View. Mr. Clark was 50 years old when he was forcibly removed from Simonstown. The West African crewmen, I've actually, there is a publication in the quarterly bulletin that I wrote about them. They hail from West Africa, all the little villages there, and they are linked to, some of them were linked to what we call the Crow tribe in West Africa, and still others were American Negroes who fought on the side of the British during the American War in the 1700s and because of helping the British, they were released from bondage and eventually brought to Freetown. So the West Africans were a combination of American Negroes and people from the indigenous tribes in Liberia, but they were all collectively um, named uh, West African crewmen and the name is spelled K-R-O-O-M-E-N. That's how they were referred to by the Navy. Okay. You also see uh, lots of artifacts, of, you know, that shows the, the, once again, the Cape Malay influence and the, the Asian, South, A um, South Asian influence with the spices and the rutis and the various cooking implements that were also inspired and brought here by the East. I'd like to just discuss the actual Amlay family themselves. Mr. Dawood Amlay's parents and his father, there's a photo of him up here. It's Mr. Dawood Amlay's father. There were two men who were Indian Sikhs who arrived here from India and they married two sisters. And the Amlay family, there was a lot of, I found in Simonson, a lot of intermarried. Mr. Mrs. Davidson's mother and, and, and father were actually first cousins. There were lots of arranged marriages in those days. Mrs. Patty Davidson was two months old when the family, the Emily family moved to this house and her father carried her into these doors. The, the, the um, house had a different name then. It was called Villa Marina and her father changed the name. If you look at the door, he carved her name and he called it Villa Zane so it was named after this is Mrs. Davidson's mother here yeah? this is Mrs. Davidson when she was a teenager and that is that's the family outside the the home itself they were a very close-knit family they were also the last family to be forcibly removed from Simonstown as a matter of fact, her brother refused to move and one day in 1975, after everybody else had been moved, the Navy, a Navy truck turned up and they basically loaded him and his family on the truck and moved them to Ocean View. This area here used to be a balcony. This house was Victorian, the, the facade was Victorian and this was the, the, the balcony and it had the beautiful Victorian balustrades. But the Navy, when they used this house after the family were forcibly removed, they boxed this in like this. This gentleman over here is one of the first um, people from India, business people. He was a merchant who arrived and lived in Simonstown. I just want to show you this Auntie Kubi. I hope she'll be here today. Auntie Kubi can be traced right back to the Kramat in Simonstown. 
which I'll speak to you more about later. She was the daughter of, she is the daughter of Haji Bukai Manuel, who was one of the leading people in Simons, in the Simonstown community and at the mosque. This is, Auntie Kubi is in her 90s now, but she's an amazing woman and she's a mine of information about old Simonstown. So I hope she's going to be coming. This obviously just shows the um, cutting of the meat and the, Hello. Right. This section just de de displays and depicts the, the Hajj and various people in Simon's town who went on pilgrimage. And if one of the members that most of the people in this, this town at the time were very poor, you can imagine what it, an even bigger thing then it was for people to go on the Hajj because very few people could attain that, that pillar of Islam for economic reasons. We'll just go to the next. In 1947, when the king and the queen came to, the, the royal family came the visit, Mr. Amlay, being a very prominent man, was part of the royal, um, you know, welcome committee to the royal family. If you look here, you'll see this is how Amlay House used to look. You see with the lovely balconies and balustrades. This is Haji Bakar Manuel over here, Auntie Kubi's father. He left a diary that UCT Sociology Department has on his visit to Mecca. And while he was there, he made friends with the people in the colonial, you know, the people in the, the, the Navy and the, the Admiralty. He was a guest at the home of some of these very wealthy people and he records all of that in his diary. So he had quite an interesting life. This was Mr. Amlay himself. Just show you Mr. Amlay here. And this was after he was forcibly removed. This was one of his... Look at today, if you think of modern technology and you think those days, this was his poster, <laughs> you know? In 1942, just a handmade poster for getting people to vote. And after 17 years of service, when the, the, the people who were labelled coloured in um, Simonstown were forcibly removed, Mr. Amlay resigned. I also want to show you if it's on this wall, and I'm trying to see if it is. Um, no, it's not there. I want to show you the original letter that arrived telling the family they must move. I think it's just been moved to another spot, but we'll find it. This photo always makes me very sad. This gentleman was, this, he was 82 in the 1960s, he was a tailor in Simonstown and he'd just been told that he must move and his face just tells me of the pain that he'd been born here, his family had lived here for the last 200 years and now he could continue trading as a tailor in the town but he wasn't allowed to be here before 6 in the morning and after 6 at night and it's just the, the kind of look at, at betrayal and hurt and all these lovely homes they were left empty and eventually vagrants moved into these homes, but they'd rather have had at that time a vagrant messing up the home, which happened with this house, than having the original occupants in the house. So we've come out of very, very damaging history and there are lots of people who are still hurting terribly. Morning. I want to mention to you this, this section over here depicts Luyolo village. Luyolo village was the first black, what in those days was called a black African location in the Cape. There were men, in 1857, a few young Kosa men were sent to work for the Navy after the Kosa cattle killing, but they were in a minority. Then when it was decided to build the Simonstown station, some men were brought from the Eastern Cape and you know my memory now I think yeah, the station was completed in 1896 these men were brought in 1893 to, to build the station they in those days most black African men were migrant laborers and they would be traveling on their own and leaving their families behind these men I've interviewed people in, in Google Air too and you know got a lot of the history from them and these men said we don't want to live separately from our families. We want our families to live with us. So what the town council said is fine, you can have your families live with you, but you've got to earn less. And they rather accepted earning less and having a family life 
than being separated and that is why the people in Luyulu, they, they did incredibly well, they were highly educated people because they had a solid family structure which is something that so many black South Africans have not had in this country for many, many years. So if you, you could bring your camera closer. These men lived on the, after they built the, the Simonstown station, after it was complete, they were living in little tents along Simonstown station and a Mr. Hugo who was on the Simonstown town council said he doesn't want to drive past these people in tents. So he allocated four hectares of land on the slopes of the mountain above Paradise Road and the people named it Luyula Village, which is also called Gay Village, meaning happy. <laughs> okay, and they built, look at these houses, they were beautiful houses, built there. These, it's just depicting a wedding. The people of Luyula were the first people to be moved out of Simonstown, and they thought that they were being moved because of the protest by people from Luyula about the Sharpeville massacre. They protested and walked to Jubilee um, Square protesting and they were moved out. They were all moved to Guguletu and when I went to Guguletu I found that people from Luyolo village were living in the same street in Guguletu so they've managed to maintain that sense of, of um, community. So one of the gentlemen I dealt with there, Mr. Boss and Poo, who really wanted his land back, who's been battling to get the land back, has sadly died since um, you know, I started this research on Simonstown. Coming over here, this is a very important aspect in speaking about the history of people of Simonstown. When one considers the location of Simonstown being close to the sea, people were able to, even though they were poor, and people say we were poor and we didn't have fancy clothes, but there was always food on the table. Everyone I've interviewed has said that to me. Because of fishing, because of the location near the sea, Fishing helped uh, families achieve nutritional um, economy. They were able to, to feed their families. Even if they earned a little money, they could go and catch a fish. And there were, of course, three very important families, or four actually, were trek fishing families. I'm going to do a talk about that later, so I won't go into that too much now, about these specific families, except to say that people achieve nutritional economy. I will uh, do the talk on the trek fishermen later, so then we'll go more into the trek fishermen. It's interesting that the museum are also, they've just depicted the sissy ghoul. The family, Sissy Gould's family, they weren't from Simonstown, but they've been honored at this museum because of their very interesting history and link to slavery. Mr. Rachman was what they called a free black. He wasn't a slave. And when people refer to someone as being a free black, it could mean that he was from Asia or from Java or from Africa. Anyone who wasn't white and wasn't a slave was, was defined as being a free black. Most of the free blacks in Simonstown were wealthy people from the East. They either came here as, as political prisoners or as convicts under the uh, VOC. And I've looked at some of the cases and when people were brought here as a convict, it didn't mean that they did really evil things. It might have mean that they had an argument with someone in the VOC and they were sent as a convict. So Mr. Rachman was a wealthy, um, free black gentleman and he saw his wife who was a slave. He saw this beautiful woman and apparently he said he'd never seen such a beautiful woman in his life before and he bought her in order to marry her. They had a greengrocer in town, greengrocer, and their son was Dr. Abdurrahman. They sent their son out of the country to be educated. Uh, people who, um, who weren't white were not, didn't have access to university education then. He married a Scottish woman, Helen Potter James, and one of their daughters, the two daughters, was Sissy Gould, who was quite a firebrand in political circles in the 1940s. Over here, I'm looking for Percy Kindo. We have all the, the, we have people who've achieved various, we have the, the painters and the dancers. And one of the people who, we've got Peter Clark, one of the people who achieved amazingly um, was Percy Kindo. The Kindo family have a very interesting history in Simonstown. And I have to tell you about people who were called prize Negroes. When Britain abolished the slave trade in 1808, slavery didn't end, but the slave trade was abolished. And with the slave trade being abolished, 
slaveholders couldn't buy any more slaves. So they, what they did then is they started treating the existing slaves better because they were like a commodity that they now needed to look after better because they needed to reproduce themselves. Another way of getting slaves was to indenture people who were liberated of slave ships. So what happened in Simon's time is that the British Navy had an anti-slavery patrol. These men would go out skirting the seas and they would impound uh, ships that were found to have slaves on them. If they found the slaves on the ship, the slaves were impounded as, as being gifts to the crown and the, slave, the ship itself was impounded as a gift to the crown. The slaves were then labelled prize negroes and they were indentured for a period of 14 years. In other words, they were enslaved for a period of 14 years. I'm showing you these kaparans. The thing about slavery in the way of, the whole thing about slavery is the way it affected people mentally. Slavery was about dehumanizing people and making them accept their state of slavery. And the way to do that was to make people feel that they were less. One of the things in differentiating slavery, uh, slave people was a rule that slaves were not allowed to wear shoes. So what the men did is that they made these shoes, you see these kaparans? They made these shoes to protect their feet from burning in the sun. They carved out these kaparans, so that is what men, male slaves wore. Okay, and then of course we've just got the, um, if you look here you'll see just photos of various people who were forcibly removed from Simon's town. And you can sense here how, you know, you look at these photos, you sense the kind of connection people had to the sea, the connection that they had to their communities because they went back for so many years. And when they were removed, it was a rapture of, of a community, but it was also a huge attack on the no, south But see? just to say that the hugest, the people who suffered most during slavery and during forced removals, who were most under attack, were in fact the males because the men had to face their families knowing that they couldn't protect their wives and children from being moved out of their family home. And in the same way, during slavery, a slave woman, if she was considered very beautiful, if she was very charming, she could get out of, she could marry out. Some slave women married Dutchmen, for instance, but the males didn't have anywhere out of it. And they were most the ones who were most brutally attacked because they were attacking the male base and thus weakening the whole community. I hope you've enjoyed the tour of our museum and the historical tour and that it's been helpful. Charlene, thank, thank you. you for that. I think that was a very interesting um, walk about in the museum and you've given us lots of insight into the people of Simonstown, their history, where they've come from and I know that even some of our staff members benefited yeah, from that so. because they're from this community. <laughs> the museum itself, Give us some directions to the Simonstown Heritage Museum because when we were coming here this morning we couldn't find the place and lots of our viewers probably are in the same boat. Yeah. So how does one easily access the museum? Well, the easiest point when you come to Simonstown is the toy museum on the corner. I always say to people, just come down. So along the main road? Uh, along the main road and when you see the toy museum you turn left and Amley House is on your right hand side. Yeah. So that's, uh, yeah. I, I think what we also will do in the future is pop around again and make sure that we grab some of the history because yeah. there is too much to go into one program Absolutely. and that's something that we need yeah. to come and chat yeah. you about. Yes, I am also, I'm almost finished writing up a book on the slave, the slave history of Simon Stone, so that should be published this year. So there will We be can that catch up with well. you on that one. So. Yeah. Well, okay. but so that concludes our visit to the Simon Stone Heritage Museum. Hope it's been an interesting one for you. Thank you and goodbye.